seventh psalm, the psalm of worship. The psalmist tells us to make a joyful noise or to shout joyfully unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. And it is this morning with gladness and delight that we collectively worship. We come before our Lord with a song of thanksgiving and praise. We're called in this psalm to be thankful to him, to bless and praise his name. But the psalmist doesn't stop with just telling us to joyfully come before our God. The psalmist also reminds us that it is God's goodness and fatherly tenderness that draw us to this joyful adoration. The psalmist goes on to tell us that the Lord himself is God. He is our father and our sovereign king. He has made us and we belong to him. We are the sheep of his pasture and he is our shepherd. The Lord is good. His mercy and loving kindness are everlasting. His faithfulness endures to all generations. What a thought this morning as we come before our King to worship. This morning, whether it is that you're full or empty, you've come here today. Whether you're burdened and weary or whether you feel light and happy, we invite you to come and be refreshed in His everlasting goodness and love. Let's stand together this morning. Come, people of the risen King who delight to bring Him praise. Let's lift our voices in worship to our King this morning.
was very, very great. Psalm 68, sing unto God, you kingdoms of the earth. Sing praises to the Lord, Selah. To him who rides on the heavens, the ancient of heavens. He who sends out his voice, a mighty voice. Ascribe strength to God. His majesty is over Israel. His strength is in the clouds. Oh God, you are awesome from your sanctuaries. The God of Israel is he who gives strength and power to people. Blessed be God. Behold our God as we exhort each other, as we lift up our hearts. Who has held the oceans in his hand? Behold our God. Let's worship him together today. online today with us. That's wonderful. Glad you could tune in this morning. So we're going to start a a little series today, and we're going to take a a four-week section for this series. It's going to be kind of a busy four weeks uh, for us as a family, and so the Jeremy and Johnny are going to jump in with me and, and help me with this series. But yesterday, Uh, For the day, I was on an ordination council. I'm over in Frostburg, and and that's where, you know, a bunch of pastors come in and question a young man that's going to be ordained from ministry, ordained from ministry, yeah, for ministry. And so we did that yesterday, and then tomorrow our family heads out, and I'll be preaching for Pastor Joey um, the first part of the week. He's doing a youth rally there in, in Indiana. And then we'll come back, um, the family will come all the way back. I'll probably just come back to Ohio for a day and then back to Indiana. And I'll be preaching a singles retreat in Colonial Hills there all day Saturday. We'll probably get home about midnight 
And then a week from today, we jump in the vans and we'll throw four crazy teenagers in our van and there'll be 36 other ones going. And we'll be jumping in vans and heading to Florida then. And so we'll drive down to Florida and be back. So it's going to be a crazy, um, crazy couple of days, 14 days for us. So prayers would be appreciated, but looking forward to it. Looking forward to being with Joey and Sam and just catching up with them and and having a good time there. So for the next four weeks, we are going to do a series, and and we've titled the series, if you're able to see it on social media, Teach Us to Pray. And, And this is a question that the disciples asked Jesus or asked of Jesus, you know, Lord Jesus, teach us to pray. And when we think about praying and we think about a subject like this, you think, Trey, I don't need to learn how to pray. You know, I've been saved, some of you have been saved 40 years. Some of you maybe have been saved 50 plus years. You know, you take 50 plus years of salvation and praying over three meals a day, you've said a lot of prayers. So why do I need to learn how to pray? I've been saved 30 plus years. Why do I need to revamp and learn how to pray? Sometimes we just frankly don't know how to pray. We had a national tragedy happen with a school shooting you know, a week ago. And as I've been pondering that and praying for those families... I have said over and over again, Lord, I don't know how to pray. I've never experienced that. I can't even, my mind can't even comprehend what it would be like to be one of the families that received the phone call that your child was killed. What it would be like to be one of the children of the the family whose, whose mother was killed in that shooting and then whose father had a heart attack and died two days later. And now in a span of just 48 hours, they, their parents are gone. How, how do you pray for that? How do you pray in that situation? And now the disciples are with Jesus, and, and they're, they're, there's things going on. And they're like, man, we, we don't even know how to pray. It's true. And there's, there's times in life that, that we just go through routines, and we pray without even thinking about what we're praying. You've heard me use the illustration a hundred times, but when it comes to eating, I honestly, I just pray routine. God, thank you for this food. I pray now you'll bless it to our bodies. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I I could do it in my sleep, and then halfway through the meal, everybody's like, hey, did we pray? Like, yeah, I prayed, okay. But we don't even remember if we prayed because it's just so routine. And unfortunately, it can be that way in our personal, private prayer life as well. We just pray routine. And then we'll have a sermon like this or we'll have a guest speaker come in. I always say, if the Lord called me to advance, I'm gonna get people to come forward because we feel like we don't do well enough at either one of them. And when we have somebody come in and they're preaching on prayer or we hear a missionary tell a story about answered prayer or we we read a book on, on fasting Then we get all excited and we get all wound up and and then we're going to change our prayer life, right? And and you've all done it. We've all done it. And I'm just going to pray more. Or that's that's what I want to be. I want to be a prayer warrior. I want to be able to talk to God. And as I was thinking on that, I was thinking about my own life and and it's from the time I was a kid, I'm watching it now in, in the boys, my boy's life and and back before you could just jump on YouTube and back before you could watch whatever you wanted to, you were subject to whatever was on TV and wherever the antenna was pointed and however you tuned it in. And I loved it when I caught Sunday afternoons when they were having the triathlon, the Ironman Hawaiian triathlon special on NBC on Sunday afternoon. It was always after football season and usually before baseball season and they would, they would have these stories about these triathletes. And I would watch these and I would get so excited. They would follow the life of this athlete or they'd follow this life of someone who maybe was out of shape or had a tragedy. And and then they became an Ironman triathlete. And I would watch this and think, man, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to be an Ironman triathlete. So let's say this afternoon this happens and you watch this. 
You think, man, I'm going to be an Ironman triathlete. That's what I want to do. So the first thing you've got to do is you've got to find a bike. And so you head out this week and you start looking at yard sales and Facebook marketplace and sure enough, you find a bike. Okay, it even has a bell on it. And now I've got my bike and now I've got my running shoes and and I'm just going to head out and I'm going to become a triathlete. And so next week comes and Monday morning, you get up and you jump on your bike. And you head on the trail and you throw it on the back of the car. You got a bike rack for it. You go down the trail and, and, and you ride your bike. Man, you ride it 10 miles. Well done. I just got a, a notification from a guy I follow on Twitter that at 8 o'clock, exactly 8 o'clock this morning, he clocked in 112 miles on his bike. Okay, in three hours. He started at 5 o'clock this morning. So 10 miles, well done. So you do 10 miles on this bike on Monday morning. And then Tuesday morning, and you're going to get up and you're going to run. Well, when you get out of bed, man, things just feel a little different. <laughs> 10 miles and your legs and your backside are just feeling things they've not felt in a long time. But that's okay because I'm going to be a triathlete. I'm going to run. And so you get out, you drive down to the trail again, and you run a couple miles on the trail. And then Wednesday morning you get up and you've got to head down to the lake and swim. But, man, it's a little chilly out. You're thinking that water is going to be kind of cold this morning. I don't think I'm going to swim. I'll skip my swim today and then I'll ride my bike again tomorrow. And then you wake up Thursday morning and you think, man, I don't think I'm ready to sit on that seat again. And before you know it, the bike's got an inch of dust on it and your dreams of doing a triathlon have been dashed because it wasn't what you thought it was going to be. It's too late to get started. And we do that in our prayer life. We get so excited that I'm going to pray and I'm going to set out, and I'm going to pray for missions on Monday, and I'm, I'm going to pray for this on Tuesday, and I'm going to pray for this on Wednesday. And by Wednesday morning, when your alarm goes off, you've had a long week already. Man, I can't get up 15 minutes early this morning. I need this 15 minutes of sleep. And then Thursday comes, and I've already missed Wednesday, so what's the point of jumping into Thursday? Come Monday, I'll, I'll really start my prayer life. Monday comes, and we're done. We're not praying the way that we did. And so if I want to be an Ironman triathlete, honestly what it's going to take is accountability or it's going to take a coach and it's going to take a very good plan. I can't just go out and jump on my bike and say I'm going to be a triathlete. I just can't go out and jump in the water and start doggy paddling for 15 minutes expecting to become a triathlete. And so in this series... If you will, Jeremy, Johnny, and I are going to act as coaches. Now, granted, we're player coaches. We're just in the trenches with you, trying to figure this out with you. We're all learning together. But we don't just want to encourage us as a church. We want to instruct on prayer. And and what does the Bible say about praying? And how can I have a, a prayer life? And so this series should, and this series could, honestly, completely change the way that we pray. It completely changes my, my idea of prayer. And you say, but Trey, again, I've been saved for 40 years, and I've been praying for 40 years. And I, I understand that, and, and that's fine. I'm not telling you to change. But, but here's one of the problems with being saved for 40 years, or I'll use my own self, being saved for 30 years. In prayer. True story. Heard it from a pastor. So a pastor was up and he called two deacons up to take up the offering. And this pastor was sitting up here as a, a guest pastor, and the head pastor called the the deacons up. So two deacons walk up the middle, and you you remember how it was. They stand on either side and they stand there, and the pastor calls on one of the deacons to pray. One of the deacons began to pray, and the guest pastor said he heard a noise in the auditorium. Somebody was talking. He's like, that's weird. Why would anybody talk during prayer? And he said, well, surely he'll stop here in a second. And he didn't stop. The talking continued. So the guest pastor, who was telling this story, he said, I looked up, and it was a five-year-old boy on the front row talking. He's like, and then I started to watch him talk, and I realized that he was just repeating the prayer of the deacon. 
But then I realized he wasn't repeating the prayer with the deacon. He was praying with the deacon. Word for word verbatim. The two of them were praying the exact same prayer together. Well, come to find out that little five-year-old's father was the deacon. And that deacon has prayed the same way at home and at church for five years. And that little guy had his dad's prayer memorized and he was just saying it with him. If our kids were listening to us pray, would it be the same way? Are we saying the exact same things to God every single day? Listen, if I said the exact same thing to my wife every single day, how deep would our relationship be? Not very. Good morning, good morning. How was your day? It was good. How was your day? It was good. How are the kids? They are fine. Good. Thank you, thank you. Bye, bye. God, thank you for this day. I pray you'll be with my family. Bless them. Help mom and dad. God, I pray you'll be with the kids. I pray for the grandchildren, that you'll just keep them safe today. We pray for all those who are sick, that you'll just help them to get better. We pray for our missionaries, that you'll be with them. And God, I just need a good day today. In Jesus' name, amen. I know that sounds strange, but I might not be too far off. Why do we struggle? I think sometimes we struggle in our prayer life because we straight up do not know how to pray. You know, if I don't know how to go out and set out and to train, if I don't know how to go out and set out and ride a bike, if I don't know how to go out and do these things, why do I need to do it? I quit. Man, what's the sense of even praying? I feel like my prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling. Why even try? I'll let somebody else pray. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, you don't need to turn there, but 1 Samuel chapter 3, Samuel's a young man, Eli's the priest, and Samuel goes to bed, and you'll remember the story. He's lying in bed, and he hears a voice, Samuel, Samuel. You know, only five times in the Bible you'll find someone called of God in direct address with their names being spoken twice. Samuel, Samuel. He gets up startled. He thinks it's Eli the priest. He runs over and he says, yes, Eli. And he's like, I didn't do anything. Go back to bed. Samuel goes back to bed. Samuel, Samuel. He gets up. He goes to Eli the priest. Eli's like, God is speaking to you. And this is foreign because the Bible says in this day there was no word of the Lord. So he goes back to bed and it's Samuel, Samuel. And he gets up and he says, yes, Lord. And God says anything, or, or Sam, yes, anything, okay, that you want or need or what you're looking for. And he speaks to Samuel. So let's say tonight, okay, you're lying in bed and God comes to you and says, you know, Daniel, Daniel. And you're startled and you get up and God says, Daniel. And you say, yes, Lord, speak. I'm listening. And, and as God's speaking to you, you say, hey, God, one second. While you're here, I really want to know how to pray. And God says, no problem. Daniel, I want you to jump on Amazon. <laughs> okay, okay, God. Um, and I want you to find this book. And you buy this book on prayer and you do everything this book says. I'm going to hear your prayers. I'll answer your prayers. And this is the golden guide to prayer. God's gone. What's Daniel going to do? Where's my phone? Where's my phone? But he's not just going to buy one copy. At least he shouldn't. Maybe he'll just try it. He'll buy a copy, does it, tries it, and he knows his prayers are being answered. This is amazing. And then Daniel comes and tells me and said, we got to get this book to everybody in the church. It's like, I agree, let's buy them. And we buy these books up and we're handing them out. This is, this is the secret to prayer. You pray this and, and these things are going to happen. You say, Treg, that's crazy. Listen, guys have made a lot of money on this. Some of you are old enough to remember Prayer of Jabez, right? And, and so we get this book and we hand it out. And th this is going to be God's secret to prayer. And we're going to forget everything we've ever done with prayer. And we're going to dive into that book and we're going to do exactly what it says. My two sermons that I'm going to do in this series is going to be from a secret prayer book. And, 
It's a book that tells us exactly how we should pray. John Piper says this, if I try to pray for people or events without having the word in front of me guiding my prayers, then several negative things happen. One is that I tend to be very repetitive. I just pray the same things all the time. Another negative thing is that my mind tends to wander. None of us have had our minds wander while we're praying. Father, I pray that you'll just be with Candace as she has her, her field trip today. They'll have a good time. Candace needs $20 for that field trip. I forgot to give her money for her field trip. Carrie, Carrie, did you give her money for a field trip? No, I forgot. Oh, I'm gonna have to go to the bank and get $20 for that field trip. What just happened to my prayer life, right? Or I'm praying, Lord, as I have this meeting today, I pray you'll just guide and direct in that meeting. Man, what am I gonna say in that meeting today? I wonder what so-and-so is gonna do. Man, what should I wear? Oh, God, sorry, I'm back. Um, right? We daydream, we wander in our prayer life. Robert Murray McChaney, turn the Bible into prayer. Some of you read through the Bible in a year. McChaney's got his own Bible reading plan that many of you use. Turn the Bible into prayer. This is the best way of knowing the meaning of the Bible and learning to pray. Take your Bibles and go to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Let's go back to what I mentioned earlier. How in the world do I pray for those families in Texas? So as I was meditating on that and pondering that and where they are, the Lord brought me to Psalm 22 and verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Or why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning. Do you think the families that lost those children feel abandoned by God? Absolutely. If that was my children, my school, or my wife, God, how could you let that happen? How could you let that door not latch? Why couldn't, why did I send my kids to school today? They were sick and wanted to stay home and I made them go to school and now I don't have them anymore. God, why? Why have you forsaken me? God, in the daytime I cry, in the night season I'm not silent. My tears are going up to you, right? But then verse three says, but you are holy. And, and thou inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted, and you did deliver them. So as I've been thinking of this tragedy in Texas, this is how I've been praying. God, I know these families feel abandoned by you. I know these families are lying in bed at night and crying, and throughout the day they come to tears, and they're going to be doing this for several months. And God, they feel like that you're not hearing them. They feel like that you're not comforting them. But God, I pray that they will see that you are holy. And God, I pray that they'll trust in you. So I'm just taking Psalm 22 and I'm incorporating that into prayer for them. So as we see, I'm praying the Bible. And as we look at this study, we're going we're gonna to look at praying a psalm. And I think the psalms are a wonderful place for us to begin when it comes to praying the Bible. And then in a couple weeks, I'm going to preach on praying out of Philippians. Peace Cazaro, the author of Emotional Healthy Spirituality, Emotional Healthy Leadership, a great author, said this, I spent the morning praying Psalm 116 to 118 with this verse as the center. The Psalms are one of God's greatest gifts to us, teaching us to pray, giving us language, shaping our hearts. It is, is it any wonder all, all scripture from Genesis to Revelation is one extended invitation to offer thank offerings to him. 
So when we see a picture like this, we think of somebody that just read their Bible and now they're praying. But when I see a picture like this from now on, and when you see a picture like this from now on, what I want you to think is somebody folding their hands and praying the Psalms. Or folding their hands and praying the Scriptures. So how do we do it, Coach? Okay, that sounds great. That's a great pep talk. But if I was just to open my Bible and read, the king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, in thy salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice. How can I pray that? Well, that's what we're going to go through. I want to guide in some of that. So how do we pray? What do we pray? The disciples say, teach us to pray. It's interesting when the disciples say, teach us to pray, if you want to argue with me, well, then the Lord taught them how to pray. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we've forgiven those that trespass against us. Lead not our hearts into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As a Catholic, we quote that. We quoted that. Protestants quote it. They quote it before events. We can quote it as Christians. Obviously, I've quoted it a few times. But I can quote that, and it means absolutely nothing. And it's funny, in the same section that Jesus is teaching them to pray, he says in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7, don't pray with vain repetitions. And that's what we're doing. We're praying with vain repetition. And so really, the Lord's Prayer is not found there in Matthew it's found in John 17 when the Lord prays so if the Lord's praying in the garden of Gethsemane and why isn't he praying the Lord's prayer because that wasn't God's point when he said Jesus's point when he said this is how we pray so you're there in Psalm 22 I want to take your attention now to Psalm 23 and this morning I'm going to use Psalm 23 as our example on how to pray And the reason I chose Psalm 23 is because the majority of us have at least some of it memorized. I was was out on the run yesterday. I was out on a run yesterday. That's loud, Bob. Your ears must be struggling. So I was out on a run yesterday, and I'm praying as I'm running. And again, it's hard to stay focused as as you're running and as you're praying. But if you've got a guide to go, it makes it so much easier. And so the guide for me was Psalm 23. We know the psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death... I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So the first thing we see then is the Lord is my shepherd. We talk about acts of prayer, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Again, I think it's good for us to start with praising God. It puts us in a spirit of who God is and where God is. And so as we pray Psalm 23, I want us to think about praise and thanks. Lord, you are my shepherd. Right away, we can say, God, thank you for being my shepherd. But then I want to think about what a shepherd does. Okay, what's the rule as we think about a rule? What's a biblical role of a shepherd? Okay, the shepherd is there to keep the sheep safe. The shepherd is there, okay, to guide the sheep. The shepherd is there to provide food for the sheep. The shepherd is just there. His presence is among the sheep. If needed, the shepherd could shear the sheep. So God, I just thank you that you are my shepherd. I thank you, Father, that you're with us, that you will never leave me, that you will never forsake me. God, I thank you for providing for us. I thank you for safety as the shepherd that you gave us as we all went separate directions yesterday. And as a shepherd, I pray that you will just be with my family as we all go separate directions today. But then we think about John chapter 10. 
And Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. And the good shepherd does what for his sheep? The good shepherd giveth his life. I know each of them by name. God, I'm so thankful that even today you know me. Father, not only do you know my name, you know the very hairs on my head. God, you know the struggles that I'm struggling with right now. And God, you know the fear that's there. Help me to deal with that fear. And you know the anxiety that I have. Help me to deal with that anxiety. And God, thank you as the good shepherd for giving your life for me. That should have been me suffering the wrath of God. It should have been me, okay, that had to experience that pain. But, but yet you took my place. And God, I thank you for being my shepherd. The Lord's my shepherd. But as my shepherd then, okay, not only do I praise and thanks, but now I have provision. I shall not what? Want. I shall not want. And we talk about shall not want. We think, man, God's going to give me everything I need. No, it's not so much that God's going to give me everything I need. It's just I'm going to be lacking nothing. And, you know, in, in, in life, sometimes we feel like we need things. The, the Bible says, thank you, mammoths, don't cover another's fields, don't cover, you know, somebody else's spouse, don't cover um, their flocks. And, and so I, as, as thinking about this, I'm thinking about, you know, you walk out on my deck and I can look over things and, and I don't know if I'm so much coveting my neighbor's houses, but, and, and it's not so much their flocks that I covet, but it's kind of like that in the fact that I look off of my back porch and off my back porch, I see this beautiful blue Mustang convertible. And then I walk on my front porch, and my neighbor across from me has a black and a white Mustang convertible. And then I look to the side of me, and there's a white Mustang convertible. I'm surrounded by Mustangs, and I don't even live on a farm. And, you know, man, I really am feeling led to fit into this neighborhood. I need a Mustang, Gary. And she says, yeah, and I need a boat. It's a point made. All right, so I don't need that. God, you have supplied all I need. And Father, as I go out today, there's no doubt that I'm going to see things and I'm going to say, man, that's what I need. I have to have. Or God, help me to be content with the things that you've given to me. You are my shepherd. God, I'm not lacking anything. You, you've promised that our needs you will supply. You know, I know that my need you will supply. And Father, as I look at other pastors that are out there and other shepherds and other flocks and other church buildings or other schools and other gymnasiums, God, help me not to covet because you've given us exactly what you want us to have. And I know, Lord, you will provide. So we praise, and then we see in Psalm 23, God provides. Okay, and, and then as we read on, what's God do? Well, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Father, I pray and I see this pasture that you're going to make me to lie down in. God is going to give his beloved sleep. God is going to give his people rest. God has not created us for fear. God has not created us for anxiety. So no worry. God, help me to cast all my care upon you and just rest. As I lay here tonight and I pillow my head, allow not my mind to wake up at 3 a.m. Anxiety ridden about the things that are there. Help me just to rest in your green pastures. God, in this stillness of this moment, help me just to think on the things of you. And God, in decisions, in darkness, and distress, give me a peace that only you can give as I lie down in the green pastures that you have provided for me. And God, I know that this is the path that you want me to take. Lord, you've led me beside these still waters. You lead me, oh blessed thought, that I know that maybe this isn't the path that you would have, I would choose for myself, but I know this is the path that you've chosen for me. So as I take this path in life, as I'm sitting here beside the brook, help me just to rest. Help me to find peace in the stillness of this moment. God, help me to hear your voice in the stillness of this moment. Father, you know right now that our nation is not at peace. 
Father, you know that there's division. You know there's racism. God, you know there's wars and rumors of wars. And I pray that you will just lead our country down the path of peace. God, you know right now in India, as we heard this morning, there's pastors being persecuted. Three pastors were just arrested in a state that is supposed to be religious free in the land of India for Christianity. I pray you'll just take those leaders in and lead them in the path they need to go. And God, I pray you'll give those pastors peace, even in the midst of the storm that they are in. Help them to find the brook. Help them to find rest at this time. And so there's the path. And then God says, and he restores my soul. Father, I need restored. I need renewed. And you've told us to, we need to be renewed in the spirit of my mind. And God, help me to be renewed by the spirit of my mind. And then, God, we have your presence. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. God, make me aware of your presence as I take this valley of the shadow of death that I'm in right now. God, I do feel alone. I don't think anyone understands what I'm going through, but I know that you're there. I'm fearing evil, and I, I'm fearing what the future holds. I'm fearing for my children. I'm fearing for the world that my grandchildren are going to grow up in. But God, help me to realize that, that you're going to be with them just like you've been with me. And I pray you'll just take your rod and your staff and your presence, and I pray that you'll comfort them. Father, you know that, that, that you know, my grandmother is, is on the valley of the shadow. Father, you know that, that where they are right now, and I pray that you'll just comfort them. Help them to see that nothing will separate them from your love. Neither life, nor death, nor any creature, nor any such thing will be able to separate them from your love. And help them to feel your love and your presence right now. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. God, I pray that you will just prepare my life for what is to come. Father, I pray that you'll prepare my children, my grandchildren for what's to come. God, as these missionaries are facing persecution and, and, and with COVID restrictions again, I pray that you'll just prepare them and prepare their hearts, Father, for what's coming their way. And Father, you know so and so and I can't get along and you know my neighbor and I, we're not seeing eye to eye right now and God, you know my child hasn't talked to me in years but help me to love them as I prepare my heart in the table before the presence of my enemies. And I pray the Holy Spirit will just have control as I talk to them the Holy Spirit will have control as I work with them. And God, I pray that you will just forgive me for not loving my enemies the way that I should. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. God, I know if I dwell in your word day and night, then I shall find true success. And help me to find that in your word and that prosperity that's there. And God, give me then finally an eternal perspective. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Help me to remember that I'm not just living here for this day and age. God, there's eternal rewards and eternal rejoicing ahead of me. Help me not to get so caught up in the things around me and so caught up in the fleshly lust, but God, help me to think about the eternal, to have an eternal perspective with rewards and rejoicing. Just like that, we've prayed Psalm 23. No vain repetitions, okay? No trying to figure out what we're gonna pray. We've got an outline right there. And some of us, if we sit down and we're gonna pray for five minutes, okay, we, we pray for five minutes and we look at our watch and it's only been two minutes. And so what else am I going to pray? It's, it's here. You say, okay, Trey, but Psalm 23, but, but what else? Well, on Wednesday nights in our Bible studies, we've been doing the Psalms. I mean, tw Psalm 27, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say on the Lord. God, I pray you'll just help us to wait on you. God, I, I just, I, I want to, to have this job. I want to have this relationship. God, I, I need this, but help me to wait on you to be of good courage. And God, I pray you'll just strengthen my heart as I wait on you. Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. 
Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of thy benefits. You redeem my life from destruction, and you crown me with loving kindness and tender mercies. You satisfy my mouth with good things, so that my youth is renewed like the eagles. God, I, I pray that you will just help me to be satisfied with what you've provided. Lord, I pray my children will be content in you. Lord, you know so-and-so is very ill and sick right now. And, and God, I pray that you will just heal them, however that might be. Heal their diseases. God, I thank you for redeeming my life from destruction, from death and hell. And knowing I'll be crowned with eternal crowns and glory that will fade not away. You see, just taking some psalms. Maybe it's Psalm 114, 15, and 16. Scanning through them. There's 150 psalms. Okay, so, so take each day. What's today? The Cammie's birthday was yesterday. Happy birthday, Cammie. She's 17 yesterday. So today's the 5th. So I'm going to look at Psalm 5. Then I'm going to scan over to Psalm 35. Then I'm going to scan over to Psalm 65. Then I'm going to scan over to Psalm 95. Okay, and 125. And I'm going to look at those psalms. And I'm just going to scan them. And man, this... This psalm really speaks to the situation I'm in, and I'm just going to pray that psalm. And then tomorrow it will be 6 and 36 and, and so on. And 37, you could pray it for months. 37 is wonderful. And so I just want to encourage you, okay, if I don't know how to pray, open the book of Psalms and pray. And man, as a church, if we all prayed Psalm 23, even if you prayed Psalm 23, one for me, Lord, you are my shepherd, and I just thank you for the shepherds that you've placed at Faith Baptist Church. You're under shepherds. And I pray for Trey and Jeremy and Johnny that you will guide them in the paths of righteousness. You'll restore their souls. And God, I pray you'll make their presence known to them as they walk through the valley of the shadows of serving in ministry. Help them to remember they're not doing this for eternal for temporary rewards but for eternal rewards and God the enemies are out there and I pray that you'll just help them to love those that can't stand them man you pray that for me I would love it how are we praying Tim will you come and lead us in our closing hymn please as we think about prayer and the great strength that we can find in the Psalms. This song comes from a psalm, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Let's stand together. Today we'll sing this one verse, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And what a thought to close out today. <laughs>